in my soul. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When she sings, we feel the presence of the Lord. Don't you? God bless you, man. More grace, more anointing. In Jesus' name. Why don't you look at someone not too far away from you? Say, Jesus loves you. Say, and I love you too. With the love of God. If that is true, give the person a high five. If it's not true, hold your high five to yourself. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, I the presence of God is always thank you guys, you guys are fantastic. Sister, they have praised God. You know, uh, one of the things I always appreciate for you know when we come into God's presence is when you are capable of ascending above your reality just to give God praise. How many people can do that? You can ascend above what you are feeling, what they said about you, what they did to you, what they did not do for you, how they did not help you, and just give God praise. Is there anybody who can do that this morning? Okay, give the Lord the loudest. Praise the Lord! Thank you. You may be seated. It is always important that we learn to rise above it, you know? Rise what? Above, above it. it. Um, we were, I was, I was flying some time ago, I flew some time ago and uh, from Ifro, and when we took off, there was a bit of a turbulence, and the pilot said, don't worry, don't worry, we're going to rise above it. And then they kept going until we got to this cruising altitude where we were above the clouds, we were above, the storms were still happening, the wind was still blowing, but we were above it. You have to always learn to do what? Rise above it. Rise above your realities. Rise above whatever it is. If you are under it, you will be controlled by it. If you are above it, you will rule over it. Amen. And you know where we are seated? Where, where, where are we seated? In heavenly places. Above what? Above principalities. Above powers. Above rulers of the darkness of this world. Or spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So we are above all of those things that the devil is trying to put us under. May God help us to always rise above it in Jesus' name. So say to the neighbor, say, my dearest neighbor, my dearest neighbor rise, above it. rise above it. Now look at yourself, say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus I, will I will rise above, above whatever, whatever the enemy, the enemy is, trying is trying to put me under. Put me under. If you believe that, give the Lord a big hand. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Holy forever. All right. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Malachi chapter 1, quickly. And I want to share something I want everyone to listen to today, both old and young, because I believe it is a very controversial matter in the body of Christ. But you know, there's always a need for God's prophets to always put soundness and sanity into where there is confusion so that God's people can serve God well. Malachi chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 10 to verse 14, you know. Malachi 1 from verse 10. Our minister who did the work already read verse 6. So he was in the spirit, say amen. Knowing fully well, except he has peeped into my sermon note. Knowing well, but I believe he did not. And if he did, the Lord forgive you. But I know he did not anyway. All right. I, I'm sounding somehow, so you've got to correct this, guys. You've got to correct this. Be attentive to where I'm sounding. Thank you. I don't like the echo. I don't like to echo. Amen. Glory. Malachi chapter 1. And those of you online, I want to welcome you in Jesus' name. Malachi chapter 1 from verse 10 to verse 14. I read, Who is there even among you that will shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. And a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profound it, in that ye say, 
the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it, and ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I ask that which, um, should I accept this of your hand? saith the Lord, but cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and vowed and sacrificed unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Wow, is that not scary? That's scary. But may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Look at the said, neighbor. Neighbor. It's time to give right. It's time to give right. Well, say, my dearest neighbor, my dearest it's neighbor. time to give right. To give right. So I title this message, Giving Right. Amen. Giving what? Right. right. I know your amen will be a little bit unsafe, but it's all right because this message is meant to set you free. Giving what? Right. right. Giving is not just giving money. I want to understand that. It, it, it covers everything we do in life is what? Giving. In fact, and I said it to you, living is giving. Giving is living. All right. Somebody say, if you stop giving, you stop living. All right. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for the word that you are about to speak to your people. I ask Holy Spirit that you will fill my mouth with the words that will bring life. I also pray that I will speak your word without prejudice of any sort. I ask, Lord, that this word will cause many to have understanding with reference to their relationship with you and that which is expected of them. And at the end of the day, breaking the hold of the devil over their affairs so that they can be free men and women indeed in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, without you, we can do nothing. Therefore, permeate this atmosphere around us and permeate the atmosphere in our hearts and souls and deposit within us that which will cause our life to be better. We give you praise and we give you glory for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. And let your loudest amen ring. Amen. Amen. Giving what? Right. right. Now, there are two major ways of doing things in this world. Whenever someone is in, engaged in doing anything, there are two major ways of doing it. The first way of doing it is doing it wrong. And the second way of doing it is doing it right. So anytime at, and at all times when you are involved in anything at all, you will always realize you are either doing it right or you are doing it wrong. So it's important for us, therefore, to know that whatever we are involved in, we have to ensure that we're doing it right. There is always a right way to doing everything. And there's always a wrong way to doing everything. Marriage, for example, there's a right way to marry. And there are many people who are getting married today and they are doing it wrong. Apart from that, another example of, I can give you that buying a house, there's a right way to buy a house. The fact that you have money and you have deposit is not just enough for you to buy a house. You have to learn the right way to be able to buy it. If you do an investment, there is a right way to invest and there's a wrong way to invest. And if you don't do things the right way, the consequences are always terrible. Also, in serving God, there's a right way to serve Him and there's a wrong way to serve Him. The fact that I'm always available doing one thing or the other in the church does not mean I'm serving God right. In fact, one of the ways to serve God that the Bible tells us is this. He said we must learn to serve God with gladness. He said if you don't learn to serve Him with gladness, it will cause curses to come upon you. So there's a right way to give, there's a right way to serve, there's a right way to invest, there's a right way to do in everything. And one of the things I've come to realize is that people are no longer interested in the right way of doing things. People just want to do anything, anyway, as long as it pleases them. You will hear people say things like, well, that is the way I want to do it. Now, the way you want to do it does not mean that's the right way. In Proverbs 14, verse 14, the Bible said the backslider is full of his own ways. In other words, somebody who is drawing away from God will not see things from the right way. They will only see things from their own way. Proverbs 16, verse 25, and Proverbs 14, verse 12. He said, there is a way that cement, not that it's right, it cement right unto a man, but the end of it are the ways of death. So there is always a right way to do things, and there are always also wrong ways of doing things. And God is a stickler for the right ways. 
when you walk with God, you realize that God is not just interested in you doing things. He wants you to do them in the right way. There are many people who are doing good things in the wrong way. There are many people who are doing comfortable things in the wrong way. There are those who are worshipping God in the wrong way. There are those who are serving God in the wrong way. There are those of us who are parenting, but we are parenting our children in the wrong way. There are children who are being children in the wrong way. There is always a right way to do it because God is a stickler for that which is right. God's word tells us in the book of 1 Kings chapter 15, if you read verse 11, it was speaking about a king uh, that is called Asha. And the Bible says, and Asha, that is the king, did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as David his father. So you could see that that king did not just do things. Anyhow, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. There's a right way to say amen. There's a right way to greet somebody. There's a right way to love people. There's a right way to appreciate people. There's a right way to reward people. There's a right way to treat people. And if you don't learn this right way, God is not bound to bless everything we do until we do it right. Someone say, I will do it right. Another king in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 34, by the name Jotham, another king of Judah. Look at what the Bible said about it. He said, and Joash did that which was right. He said, Joash did that which was right. Sorry, 2 Kings 15, 34, rather. He said, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Because Uzziah did that which was right in the sight of God. My prayer is this, that at the end of this service, you will begin to do things right. Not just doing things anyhow, but doing things what? Right. If you wake up in the morning and you greet your father, that's the right way to greet him. Now, the fact that you say good morning is not enough. You can say good morning with an attitude. A very terrible attitude. The way you greet your wife in the morning also matters. The father is a good morning, darling. Don't that you have done it right. There is an attitude that follows. There is a right way to do things. And we must be stickler for what? The right way. Because God is a stickler for that. Now, when it comes to giving, there is a right way to give. There is a right way to give. The fact that I took an offering and give God an offering does not mean I've done it well. You and I need to learn the right way to be able to give to God because I've realized that many people are giving and are not seeing results, not because God, not because they are not giving to God, but they are not giving right. It is not the size of what you give that God is interested in. Because God is bigger than everything that you can ever give. God does not need money from you and I to be able to eat. God is asking us to do it right because, not because of the size, not because in size, but rather so that he can bless us. God only blesses that which is right. That which we do in the right and the proper way. That is one that God bless. There were two people in the Bible that gave to God I want to look at. The first one is by the name Cain. Cain gave to God. And then Abel also gave to God. But you realize that at the end of the day, God blessed Abel and did not bless Cain. Why? Because when Cain gave to God, he did not give right. What he gave to God, God knew that, knew that he could do much more than that, but he did not give right. And as a result, God did not bless him. My prayer is this, you will never be a generation of Cain. But rather that God will find you in the lineage of Abel to bless you in the name of Jesus. So let's quickly look at categories of givers this morning. I'm going to give about five different categories of givers. Then I will tell you why you and I need to give right and then we'll close. The first categories of giver that I've come in contact with in my life as a minister and as a child of God are what we refer to as emotional givers. Emotional givers are people who give based on the prevailing feelings or mood within them at the point of giving. Emotional givers are people who give just based on how they feel. And I realize that in the body of Christ, many people are emotional givers. The moment things are going well, we give well. The moment things are not going well, we don't give well. Not knowing that when things are not going well, God is also putting you on the scale to be able to measure your heart. Because you need to learn how to serve God both when it is well and when it is what? Not well. So God wants us to understand emotional givers are not good givers. You cannot count on somebody who is emotional. Can you imagine if a pilot is emotional and he came to fly the plane that you are flying in and on that day he's not feeling so good. On that day he is terrible. Then you, can you allow him to fly your plane? You can because you know that as emotion, because it's emotional, things can go wrong. We cannot build relationships on emotions. We cannot build our relationship with men even on emotions. 
We cannot build a relationship with God even on emotions. We have to understand that our emotions are always mo they are always in motion. I like that. Our emotions are always what in motion. That is, they are always moving. Sometimes they are good. Sometimes they are bad. You have to learn how to be consistent with God. You cannot when you are emotional, you are in the flesh. The flesh is the one country. I don't like the message I have today, so I won't give. I don't like the way the, way the usher told me to sit today, so that, that I will not give. I don't like the way the choir sat today, therefore I will not give. I don't like the way the minister did the welcome today, so I will not give. I don't like the way my sister here greeted me this morning, so I will not give. Emotions do not in any way play any vital role when it comes to blessing from God. You have to learn to rise above your emotions. Romans 8 verse 8 tells us, he said, they that are in the flesh, that is in emotion, they cannot please God. If I want to please God, my emotion must be put in its place. If I want to please God, I cannot leave my emotion. I cannot give to God based on how I'm feeling. I give to God based on who he is to me. I give to God, not based on how my emotions or my mood. You know when we have mood swing, mood swing. Today you are here, tomorrow you are there. When you are coming to church, you are not sure. No, you give to God with, with based on who God is to you. Galatians 3 verse 3, Paul was speaking to the Galatians Christians. He said, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, and you are now made perfect in the flesh? Romans 8 verse 1, he said, therefore there is no condemnation for those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8 14 says, as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We have to learn to be led by the spirit of God. If you are going to love somebody, you can't love them based on emotion. If you're going to relate to somebody, you can relate to them based on how you feel. Because I've realized that from time to time, whether you like it or not, you will always feel down or you feel up. And if you're going to relate to God based on that, then you cannot be a good giver. So there are emotional givers. Let me ask you, are you an emotional giver? An emotional giver. Or a spirit-led giver? <laughs> spirit giver? Number two, the second categories of giver I've come in contact with in the body of Christ are rational givers. The first category are what? Emotional givers. Everybody shout the second category. Want to go? Rational givers. Rational givers, listen to me very carefully. These are people that base their giving on logic and reason. Now, I love these givers because they, they make sound decisions. They make decisions based on what they have. This is what I want to give. But I want you to realize one thing. Whenever God wants to bless you as a person, he will have to take you out of your rationality. You, I have never seen anybody that use good sense to get God's blessing. You cannot use good sense, common sense to get what? Common sense only give you common blessings. When you are a giver, you can't be so rational with God. Yes, we can be rational in our mind, in, in doing things, but let me say this to you very carefully. This is important. Because one thing about rational givers is this, that they allow their work with God to be controlled by their mental prowess and intelligence. They allow their mental ability. Oh, I'm an accountant. Therefore, I know how I can manage my offering, manage my this. All of that is important. But listen to where the mistake is. Our mind should be used for a rational decision. No doubt about it. But that mind must be a renewed mind. Okay, you missed that. The mind that you are using to plan things with reference to God or rationalize it, is it a lot of Christians don't possess renewed minds. It is a renewed mind that can be rightly rational, be rational with God. But when our mind is not renewed, we will be rationally totally in carnality. We have to have a renewed mind. The Bible says in Philippians 2 5, let this mind be in you, which is also what? In Christ Jesus. Let it be in you. Let me give an example. They were going to have, there was a program holding in Jerusalem, a feast in Jerusalem, and the people were looking for, what's it called? Jesus to kill. They were to kill him. Then the disciples said, we are going. He said, you go, I will not come. And the disciples went. But after they had gone, the Bible said, Jesus came secretly. Now, I'm thinking in my mind, didn't he believe that God can protect him? Why didn't he go? He was being rational. But at the end of the day, God still wanted him in that place because he has a renewed mind, he could still submit to God. But he just went in a way where he will not be noticed. Now you have to understand this. Our mind has to be renewed. Romans 12 verse 2. Be ye transformed by the renewing of what? Of your mind. Somebody say my mind. If you cannot be rational with a kind of mind with God, 
You can't. If your mind is not renewed, you can't be rational with God properly. So people are rational and they give based on their rationality, their ability to be rational. They look at logic. They look at reasons. In the book of Ephesians 4, 23, the Bible says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. What kind of a mind are you using to judge what you will give? What kind of a mind? Oh, I'm in difficulty. Yes, I need money. But right now, oh God, I am going to give my offering, not based on the fact that I'm in need, but based on the fact that my mind is renewed and I know how to give right. I know how to give right. Some weeks ago, I was sharing with you last week, when God told me when, when, when things to do in the church, and I, I, I had to use my personal force to be able to do it. My rational mind told me, you will suffer. But my renewed mind told me, if I'm be willing and obedient, I will. Can I say this to you? You cannot obey divine instruction with rational minds. Rational minds cannot obey divine instructions. It's not possible. Rational mind cannot. Jesus spoke to Peter one day in Matthew chapter 14. He said, Peter, when he said, if it, if it be thou, bid me to come. Jesus was walking on the sea. He said, if it be thou, bid me to come. At times, we have allowed the so-called environment in which we live in, especially in this country, to bombard our mind to the point that we have become, we have become so rational, even in the way we relate to God. When they say, praise God, you give him rational hallelujah. Okay, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> We give rational. If it's time to dance, we give him rational dance. If it's time to obey your parents, you, you give them rational obedience. No. When it comes to God, God is not looking for rations. Amen? He's looking for his portion. You give to God what is due unto him. So God want, So the second category of the categories of giver are the people who give rationally. Number three, quickly. The third category that I've discovered, I'm coming to somewhere, let's keep going. The third categories of givers I've come in contact with are disproportion, disproportionate givers. Disproportionate givers. I say it again. Disproportionate givers. I say it one more time. Disproportionate givers. These are people who give in a disproportionate manner. In other words, these are those who in their giving, their giving is not in accordance with their ability, true ability to give. We are giving something, but what we are giving is not, is not synonymous or is not in accordance, cannot relate to the degree to which God has blessed you. If somebody has a savings of 9,000 pounds and you give God 10 pounds, is that, is, that, is that where? God will know that you have a savings of 9,000. That you are planning, oh, I want to buy the next house. I want to buy the next land. I want to buy the biggest this. I want to buy the next car. I want to buy this. But when it's time to give, you will give 10 pounds to God with your savings of 9,000 and you say that you have given, that is disproportionate. Oh, the amen did not ring. So I, 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 I'm on the right track. So let me, let me dwell on this very well. Disproportionate. When they say shout amen, you know you can shout more than Amen. That is what? Disproportionate. When they say, oh, can you give five pounds to help us in the children's church to put it together? Yeah, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. Disproportionate. There is nothing like, listen to me, plan, but don't plan God out of your plan. Don't plan him. I will keep saying this till Jesus comes. Don't plan God. I, I Listen, I have plans, but when God interjects, I move back. Why? Because he knows better than I do. There are people in this world who used to chase money. After they got the money, they realized that they now needed what money can buy. That's the way life is. That God is who we must chase. Who are we chasing? God. Because when you have him, you have what? Everything. A man wanted to be a millionaire by all means. He did it for over 30 years. Then he became a millionaire. And then he bought a huge house. But you know what that shocked me? After some few days of sleeping in that huge mansion, do you know where he went to? He small Hansu flat. And sat down there. And I said, what are you doing? He said, this, this feels like the real life. He said, I've gotten the money and I realized that life is more than money. Yes. It's actually more than possession. That's what I would say, what can a man give? Listen, if some people are saying, oh, if I have 10 million, my problem will be solved. It's a lie. If somebody gives you 10 million right now, your problems will not be solved. Can I say this to you? 10 million will create a 10 million problem. That's right. <laughs> okay, you, you have not been there before? That's why we don't chase money. What do we chase? 
which is God. Because it is only God's blessing that comes, that gives you fulfillment, that gives you satisfaction with it. So when you are given to that God, don't be disproportionate. Don't be. That's why in Malachi 1.14, this is what he said. He said, but cast be the deceiver. I can give you a thousand pounds now, and God knows I have a hundred thousand. I can do much more than that. I can give you 20 pounds and God knows I have 3,000 that I've saved that I can give much more than it. I can, I can take out of it and give you much more. And that is why people say, but I give, nothing comes. You did not give right. You were disproportionate in your what? In your giving. Disproportionate in your giving. And that's one thing that we, that's why God said, give me 10%. It's my portion. You rob him of it, you are disproportionate in your giving to him. Let's, 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 let's look at our giving because our giving will launch off our divine lifting. But if God can find faithful givers, he can find people who can give proportionately, proportionately, prop we will get to heaven. You will meet the widow with the widow's might. We will, we will get to heaven. Look at how Solomon gave to God. How did Solomon give to give to God? Go and eat thousands and thousands and thousands of sheep. Why? Because he's the king. His ability. He could have given God two sheep. And they will slaughter two sheep. But does that mean he has given right? No. Am I giving disproportionately? I can buy myself clothes worth a thousand pounds, but offering five pounds. Am I giving proportionately? Proportionately? In Malachi 114, look at how the Bible describes those people. He said, But curse is the deceiver. Uh -huh. Curse is who? You're not a deceiver. But curse is who, please? The deceiver. So God is placing a curse on anyone who is being disproportionate in their giving. Have you ever noticed over time that the fact that we're able to save more money that has not made our life better? We need blessing on what is saved. I, I, am, I, am I speaking to you? We need blessing on what? I want to say, God bless you with a better job, better salary. How do you now give to God? You maintain the same level of giving. And God is thinking, he said, so what should I do? Take the, take this. Why did you think I blessed you? God has never blessed any man because of himself alone. Mm -hmm. He has never. If you, are, if you are earning more than what you are earning before, God wasn't thinking of you alone when he gave you that money. He was thinking of your sister. He was thinking of your children. He was thinking of your son. He was thinking of your church. That your tithe will increase. Yes. And your giving will increase. Yes. And then the church of Jesus that you are part of able to do more things for the kingdom of God. Yes. Amen. Yes. I'm, I'm the only one here. I, I told you, I said, this one that you are giving me is a controversial message. I said, they won't say amen very well. You see, they won't say amen very well. <laughs> Bless any man. He said, I will look at Abraham. He said, I will bless you. What's the next level? And I will make you what? Thank you, a blessing. God, sometime ago, blessed me with some new suits. I took all the whole suit I have. I begin to give to people who don't have suits. Because God, I, if you keep, if God keeps, do you know if you keep buying clothes and you don't get rid of the old one? What happens to your wardrobe? Some of us just like looking at our clothes. Hey, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, what up, yeah, yeah. No! <laughs> Amen. 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 The reason why God bless you is so that you can be what? A blessing. A celebrity was caught recently driving in Piat in America. So they took him to court, find him some money. And the judge said, I won't just find you money. I want you to do community service. Give back to the community. You know what the guy said? He said, I've been waiting for a long time to give back. So God said, you have been waiting. I will make you give back. They will arrest you so you can give back. Don't wait until you are arrested to give back. We are not, we, we, look, look, at, look at what you have. Look at what you say. And look at what you... <sighs> a brother in need came to you for 100 pounds. You know you have six thousand pounds. Ah. Who did they walk into my hand? And he needed just hundred pounds. You couldn't even you couldn't even give him ten percent of it. Say, my brother, I'll pray with you. There's nothing God can do. What God can do does not exist. He has done it already. 
You are the one with the money. So what do you do with it? If you take a hundred out of six thousand, does it destroy your soul? No. The devil makes us sit down and say, hey, you are giving your life oh. Ah, let me time it by it. Let me convert it to Naira, convert it to city. What are you convert? If God converts all your blessing, say neighbor, I will never be a disposable giver again. Because that makes me a deceiver. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira was that they were like this. They had much more. They could give much more, but they still gave. You see, the point is that we are giving. But God is sitting. I'm going to take you to the widow's office, service. Jesus sat at the offering. And Jesus said at the end, let me even take you there now. Jesus said at the end, he said, all of you casted in out of your what? Your much. He said, but this woman, it was the proportion that she gave. It was the proportion. God measured the blessing Apostle Anvasili of Apostle Prosperity said, God does not judge your return based on what you give. He judges it based on what is left after you have given. That's how God judges our return. That's why we are giving and no what? No return. Because God knows you have enough. I gave you that amount that you have saved, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000. And then you are looking at it, you are like, <laughs> and you know one thing? Man is very wicked. Recently, the Bank of England and banks reduced the interest rate on, on um, what is it called? On savings. So they sent letters to everybody. So my daughter, one of my daughters got a letter saying, your interest rate has been reduced. And, and, and she said, what, what interest rate? The last time they put 0 0.1 P there. <laughs> Where are you reducing it all now? <laughs> Only God increases interest rate. Okay, you missed that. He said, give and it shall be given. God's interest rate has never changed. Good measure. Pressed, shaking, and that is God's interest rate. Bank of heaven, that's the interest rate. That's the interest rate. You put that amount of money in your account, this, that, that. You know how much they put on it for you? One pence. Five P. And is that all you are waiting for? When you could have given out of it to someone in need that God sent to you. Or given to the church when the church was looking for finances. And God will say, because you have done this, I will bless your bread. I will bless your water. Then I will give you Jada. I will take sickness out of the midst of you. Give somebody a high five. Say, I believe it. Are you a disproportionate giver? A disproportionate giver. Are you listening to me online? Are you a disproportionate giver? You know you can do but much more, but you choose not to. You choose not to. You are scared that if you do, your money will reduce. Not knowing that it is the Lord that had Paul, about the Paul planted, Apollo water, first Corinthians 3 verse 6, but God gave up the increase. Can I have your loudest amen in this house now? Say neighbor, I'm not a deceiver. See, I will show God I'm not a deceiver in the offering today. Look at this. He said, but curse be the deceiver. One day I met, listen, I met two people. Listen to this. I met two people. One person earned 11,000 pounds a month. The other person earned 300 pounds a month. I, I, I met these three people, two, these two people. And when it was time for the offering, the person with 11,000 pounds gave 50 pounds. And the person with the 300 gave 50 pounds. Who did God approve of? Think of it. Yes, he's given 50 pounds, but look at what he hands. Look at the person who also gave 50 pounds. Look at what she hands. And I'm saying, how does this match? This is not, even in my eye, this is not right. This is not right. You have given, no, some people give 50 pounds. Say, ah, I gave 50 pounds today. When you get to heaven, you see people that give 200 every month, every Sunday. You look at, are you a proportionate giver? Let's look at that. Let's look at the way we do things. Is this proportionate? So God said, let's go back to Malachi 1.14. I've got to tie it all up. Malachi 1.14. But Christ be the deceiver. Which act in his floor? Which act in his floor? Which act what? In his floor. God has never asked you to give what you don't have. He has always asked to give out of what you have. He said he had what? In his floor. That it, this is your money. It's yours. Amen. <laughs> Somebody shout amen. Yeah, that's a significant, 
a significant sheep. He said he had in his flock a male and vowed. Now this is one that shocked me. They are even vowing. If disproportionate, disproportionate givers are vowed, they are giving God vow. They are vow, oh God. They vowed and they sacrificed unto the Lord. Can somebody shout what they sacrificed? This one, two, God shout it very loud. Uh, is it you that is the deceiver? Shout it, one, two, go. Thank you. They, they have a male, but they give what? They get what? God called. It's not corrupt in their eyes. It's corrupt in the eyes of the Lord. You have a male, but you gave a corrupt thing. He said, for I am a great king, said the Lord of us. My name is dreadful among the heathen. I'm coming to that. But understand this, that God is concerned. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 17, let's go there. I want to read it, please. Put it there. Deuteronomy 16, verse 17. Thank you, guys. Put it there. A corrupt thing. Deuteronomy 16, verse 17. I want them all to see that it's in the Bible. Deuteronomy 16, verse 17. Every man, how many men, please? Every man. Thank you. Every man shall give as he is shouted able. According, now, what is our ability? According to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he had given thee. He's given thee blessings. That's the way you're supposed to give. He's given you blessings. He's blessed me, and the thing he blessed me with, I take out of it. I don't look at my need. I take out of it. Lord, you deserve this back. You deserve this bar. You deserve this bar. You deserve that bar. Because what you have done, I don't want to be a deceiver. I may not see your bank account, but God sees the balance. Yes. Hey. Some people are looking away from me now. Look at them, say, look at Pastor. Look at Pastor very well. Look at him in the eye. If you are online, look at me very well. Don't be disproportionate in your giving. Don't be. Many years ago, a man used to bless the church. Not this church, one of the churches I was pastoring. And he would just give and give and give. So one day I asked, I said, why do you? He said, because that's how much God has blessed me, sir. He said, I, I said, but there's an economic crisis. He said, no. God is blessing me in an economic crisis. He said, I will be a deceiver to say to you that God is not blessing me. God increased your salary and we can't even see the effect of the offering. Ah, the Lord has increased my salary. So where is it? You are not given as he has given you. You are given as you have planned. Because you have to pay rent this month. You have to pay that this month. You have to pay this this month. All of that God knows about. Yes. But look at what he has blessed you with. And then somebody came up and said, my child has not eaten. And he said, ah, ah. Even if you don't have anything to give, one day I'll never forget this. My wife, somebody blessed us with a bag of rice. Another person blessed us with another bag of rice. And she said, what do I eat? <laughs> kg, can you imagine? What do you want to eat all this for? <laughs> Are we that hungry? She said, God must be thinking of others. So she went around in the church and looked for people carefully that were in need. And she took the two bags, distributed it. What we left was a quarter. What we got out of Dubai was a quarter. He said, This is enough. Said, the faith that brought this two will bring more. And she gave to everyone in need. They could not believe it. Hey, for me, man. For me. Said, yes, for you. Well, what did I do? Do you have to do anything? Love does not wait for you to do something for you to give. Love gives whether you do or you don't do. Can I have a name in the house if you love God? So ask your neighbor, are you a deceiver? Are you a deceiver? Say, are you giving disproportionately? Now, number four, quickly. My time is going. The first set of givers are who, please? Emotional givers. The second set are who, please? Rational givers. And the third set are who, be Disproportionate givers. Disproportionate givers. If not, not just money, but our time. Look at your time. How much of it do you give to God? Okay, we don't come to church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even on Wednesday. When, are you there? Are you there online? Just online. Just to sit down, put the camera there and sit down and hear the word of God. You are not even, what, so where are you? Then on Saturday, it's okay, you don't meet Monday, so let's come on Saturday. Are you there? You have done shift, double shift, shift upon shift that you are shifting. <laughs> That's okay. You will do that to be able to earn your money. But after you have done that, don't give unto Caesar what belongs to God. On Sunday morning, I'm going to church. Go why? It is disproportionate to spend Monday to Saturday with man. And then the one that God deserves, you say, I won't give him. 
Sunday morning, I'm going to church. I'm going to serve God. The Bible said, don't forsake the assembly. I'm not saying you can't be blessed online, but I'm saying, the Bible said, don't forsake the assembly of one another. There's something about coming together. There's something that we receive when we touch each other, flesh to flesh, in a very godly manner. There's something. I don't want to be disproportionate. Monday to Saturday, where have I been? I've been with man. I've been with my family. Then God says, Sabbath day. He said, I won't give you. And after that Sabbath day, God said three hours. I said, no way. You ain't getting it. Then on Monday, they want to sack you at work. Ah, father, father, father. And father said, what? Me too, I won't give you. Whatsoever a man so went, that shall he also reap. <laughs> Word. Number four. Are you with me? So are you an emotional giver? Rational giver? Disproportionate giver? Then the last, the, set, the, the fourth set of givers I've met in my lifetime are inconsistent givers. Inconsistent givers. I'm not an emotional giver. Inconsistent givers. These are people who give to God as hazardly. They give to God, not because they are feeling bad, they just don't want to give. As hazardly. Giving, do you know if God said to you, I can only allow you to breathe when I feel like? Mm. You and I will not be here today. Giver, inconsistent giver. You gave last Sunday, and for two Sundays you did not give. Even if you're not attending to, I told my workers, I said, even if you're not attending to, whatever you are on Sunday, wherever, whether you are listening or not, give your offering. Don't see. So what will you give on that day? Please note this: as a man with the same measure with which you measure, it shall be what measured back unto you. It is the same measure that God is using for us. As hazard blessings. Mm, mm. So we're blessed only once a while. Mm. Yeah, that's the measure. You give once a while, so it blesses you what? Once a while. As hazard measure. Have you ever bought a car on finance and you pay a hazard? They'll take you back. They'll take you back. <laughs> you said you got them. I don't feel like paying you this month. Uh, <laughs> they said it's, it's okay. It's all right. We'll get back to you. <laughs> the next phone call you get is a bailiff. Hello, I feel like coming to pick your car. <laughs> you have, we don't do it with man. Even your tax. If you miss tax, 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 <laughs> tax evasion is a sin in this country. Not even crime, crime, sin. <laughs> tax avoidance is a different bargain. That means that you are smart with the government. You have good attempts to help you avoid tax because you know the law very well. But if you earn it and you don't, they can't even pay you. Pay as you as your salary ever increase and your tax remain the same. If it does, that means you are smart. But I pray that they won't catch you. Let your smartness be legal. Amen. Amen. Tax man, I'm telling tell them the truth. Let, your, let it be legal. Amen. There's tax avoidance. The rich do it a lot. Yes? They start a company, they go and put it to the headquarters in a tax haven. You don't know about it? They put in a tax haven. A tax haven is a place where you don't pay tax at all, or very little, minimal, insignificant tax. That's the, where the headquarters of the company is. And whenever the headquarters of the company is, where you remit what? The tax of the whole company. So they pay the tax of all the employees, but they don't pay the tax of the company. And therefore, robbing the HMRC of billions. And then you, who is only 1,500 a month, you just miss one. Then letters begin to come. We will arrest you. We will find you. We will, may God help us in this country. Yeah. Those who are rich, they went, they will go ahead and employ good accountants. Fantastic accountants to help them do their books very well and cook it. So that when anybody comes, everything. And it's, it's tax, they are using the law to avoid the tax. But you, a common man, I'm not a common man, Jesus, you're not a common man. You, the extraordinary man, you are any pay, pay ye, pay. They take it from what? From source. I met a man some time ago who has a, who has a ministry. <laughs> this is unbelievable. He said whenever he pays his staff, he has over a hundred staff. Whenever he pays his staff, he helped them remove the tithes on their behalf. <laughs> and pay them the rest. <laughs> <laughs> he said because it's tempting. When you give them the money, they won't pay the tithes. There are people in this country who are on housing benefits. And you give them the housing benefit and they refuse to use it to pay their rent. And the landlords are suffering because of that. Because men, it's difficult to trust man with what? Money. Money. Money 
changes people. In fact, no, that's not right. Money enhances what people are hiding and are revealing it. If somebody is a giver, if you give them 10 pounds, they'll give out of it. If he's a giver, if you give him a hundred pounds, you give out of it. If he's a giver, if you give him a thousand pounds, you give out of it. If somebody is not a giver, if you give him ten thousand pounds, you won't give out of it. Because it is what success does. Success enhances what you are hiding, what we are hiding. What we say, you are only humble because you are still poor. They call you your answer because you are poor. The day money enters your hand, I've been in ministry for over 30 years, I've met them. The day money, the day, ah, the, no usher can tell them where to sit again. Say, so, do, do you know who I am? Who are you? This is the house of the Lord, and we're all children of the Most High God. We are only nice because it doesn't come. The moment success comes, people seem to change. Inconsistent givers. First Corinthians 15, 15 says we must be steadfast. Steadfast means consistent with God. God hates it when we are not consistent. He hates it when we are not what consistent because he is a consistent God. How do I know? Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, the same today, and the same for how many years? Forever. He said, His compassion faileth not. Great is your faithfulness. God is consistent. And when I look at scriptures, look at how we bless consistent people. I will give them uh, give you one or two examples. Number one, the man at the pool of Bethesda, consistent man. This man sat there, he will rush for the water when the water is troubled. What did the Bible say? Somebody would have what? Enter before he got there. Does he, does he go home? No. What does he go? He goes back again. Consistency to try the next day. He goes back again. Consist until Jesus said, Ah! You have been consistent. That's right. Said, you know what? You're not going to go to the water. Right here, you're going to receive your healing. The man at the cave gate called Beautiful. Acts chapter 3. Go and read very well. The Bible said they laid him at that gate daily. Somebody shout daily. 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 He was coming there. Whether anything happened or not, he kept coming there. The day they give to him very well, praise God. The next day is back. The Bible said he came to a point that Peter and John were going to pray and they saw this consistent man. Are you consistent? Simeon was consistent. He had a word, Luke chapter 2, from God that said that you are going to see your eyes. You will not die until you see the Savior with your eyes. And the Bible said he was coming to the temple daily, daily, daily. And God gave him what he said he would give him. Anna, she was consistent. Every year, Anna was going to church. Every year, she was going to Shiloh. Every year, she was going to worship. Every year, she was going to sacrifice. Even though her situation did not change. But because she was consistent, God did not just give her a child. God gave her a prophet. After that, God gave her five more children. God told us that I will be consistent. We need to be consistent with God. Amen? We need to be what? My time is up. I can't give you the rest. But please write it down. Let me, I won't explain, but write them down. Number five. Number, is that number five now? Yes. Number five. Casual givers. Casual givers. People who just give anyhow. Casual. No purpose attached to it. Nothing. You are giving to God. You are not attaching the purpose to it. Lord, I'm giving you this for my breakthrough. I'm showing this because I believe in you. Casual givers. Then number five, number six. Quickly. Spearing givers. Spearing givers are people who give sparingly. For Second Corinthians nine six talks about them. He said. He will show us sparingly, sparingly. We just look for the spare, the spare, the spare five pounds, the spare ten pounds. Just leave it, and that is it. Sparingly, then, then, then uh, sparing givers. They, 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 they give to God without measure. I mean, sorry, with measure, sparingly they give to God. Then finally, these are the people that will shock you. Non givers, non givers. I called a man some years ago. I said you attended a church. And for one whole year, you did not give an offering. I said, clap for yourself. I said, yes, sir, you don't know, things are very tough. I said, no, honey. I said, in that same church, you were blessed. You bought a car, bought another car. This can be that tough. Non giver, they just don't see any reason why. Do you know it is what others are giving that is helping us to be able to get everybody together? Not, how can you be a non giver in this world? Give and it shall be what? Given. How can you be a non-giver? God said in his word, he said in Deuteronomy, listen to this. 
Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. Never forget that scripture. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, in case you've never read it before. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. This is the word he said. He said, three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of what? Of unliving bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles. Amen? Amen. Where am I? Keyboard players, where am I? Ah, please don't stay in the room and go and preach the word of God. We should be in the service. Thank you very much. Please, keyboard. Choose in the feast. Where are they? Okay, good. Choose in the feast of unliving. Don't touch it, young man. Choose in the feast of unliving bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacle. Now look at this last phrase. And they, can we all read together so I know that you are with me? One, two, go. And they shall not appear before the Lord thank you Saul oh time will not permit me Saul came to a point where he had to appear before his prophet I know what he told the servant he said what shall we bring to the prophet he said we have nothing the servant said I have what I have something here no, no, we're not going empty. My mother-in-law, when my wife was very young, my wife told me this. He said, our mother, every time they are going to greet their pastor, I'll visit the pastor. This day, people don't visit the pastors anymore. It's pastors that visit everybody now. Every time they are going to visit the pastor, he said, my mother will branch and buy oranges, buy banana, buy fruit. He said, my mother was not working at that time. She has retired. But she always, which one did she ask her? Mom, why do you always have to buy something for pastor? He asked her, no. He said, no. He said, the Bible said we must not appear before the prophet empty handed. I'm not asking you to buy something for me. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying for the Lord. Are you, are you hearing me very well? Yes, Let's you think. Uh, Baba Tunde. Uh, okay, that's somebody's name. <laughs> Baba has come. <laughs> Baba has come again. He just wants us to just, just bring something to it. No! I'm blessed. That's, that's, that's not too blessed to be stressed. Yeah. Amen? When I ask him for something, he does it for me. I asked something on last week, Thursday, he did it on Sunday. Yeah, I'm blessed. That's not the problem. But the thing is this, we have to learn the eternal truth. The eternal truth says we must not appear before God. What? You know why God is saying that? He has never left any of us empty. That's right. Someone said, I don't have enough money to give an offering. On your way home, you branch a bank donuts and you buy food for three children. And you have no offering for yourself and you think God is blind he sees that I know what he sees a deceiver a non-giver and then he say father bless me and he says son I refuse to bless you because you're a deceiver God only allowed the water to flow through channels Amen. only through channels a giver is a giver any point in time any day at all. One day I was in this church, I was just speaking, I listened to him, I just said this. Because then they were praying for a program and there was, we needed some money. And my wife said, okay, since there's no money from anywhere, okay, let me use my last social money. And then our account went overdraft. No, there's no overdraft. The bank sent you a, a text. You are now in your official uh, overdraft. Arrange to replenish your account. Lest we... You, you must have received it once in a while. If you have not received it, ah, thumbs up for you. You don't know what we feel. <laughs> you are not touched with the infirmity of our, <laughs> our pain. You can't understand. You need to have been there for you to know. Amen? If you have never been the valley, you can't appreciate the mountain. Are you hearing me? And I just said it, just listen to me. I just said it in passing. I wasn't making any reference to it. Just to say, she, was, she, just, she took the money out and gave it. I said, wow. I just said, God bless you. But in the service on that day, I just said it casually. After the service, one woman just went to her and said, Mama, give me your account. She said, no, your account cannot be in overdraft. That's a giver. Let me give up. I said, what comes me? Me to have my own problem. What am I trying to say? Don't be a non-giver. Don't be a what? A non-giver. Because God has not left any of us empty. A 16-year-old girl walked up to me after service one day. I never knew that these teenagers here in the world that they are so blessed. 
He says, sir, I was so touched by the, by the work today, so I took everything in my account, I gave it as my offering. What? Do you know God sees that? Yeah. Now I said, he's in Asia, he doesn't have any problem, he doesn't have any bill to pay. No, no, it's not what you have to pay, it's the fact that you even the talk. Have you ever saw somebody say, it's not the size of the gift, it's the size of the thought. That you even think that I should get something. Ah! That you even think that I should get something. Two days after, no, the Sunday after, the same teenager, sir, you won't believe this, sir. During the week, Uncle Sir so gave me 50 pounds. Wow. Do you know how much was in our account that she gave? Everything, seven pounds. My God gave 50. God taught me a lesson on that day again. <laughs> Father, may I not be a non-giver. That's why when you get to heaven, you'll be shocked the people you will see that have been approved by God. We will be amazed. There are people that we think they ought not to get anything. But yet, can I close with this? Let me close with this. This scripture has been a blessing to me. Someone said, I will give right. Shout like you mean it. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? In Luke 19, that came to Jesus? Remember you could not see him because of his what? Of his height. He was a short man. That's why I don't disrespect short people. Because God likes short people. So because somebody is short, you don't say, I am tall, you are short. God likes short people. Because he created them all. And then Jesus saw him. And Jesus said, come down. Today I'm going to eat in your house. And do you know what the Pharisees said? How can you bless a publican? They never knew what he has done in the secret. So the man said, said it to them. He said, Jesus, everyone that I've taken from, I return for food. So that means if he took 4,000 pounds from you, thanks for? He returned 16,000. I like that kind of thing. That's a serious interest. May that kind of people hold me money. That they will bring you back. Listen to this. He said, he said I returned fourfold. He said, everything. He said, I gave back. It was in that giving. They did not look. There are people doing this in secret. To the Lord that you have no idea of. Don't be a non giver. Don't be a what? And let me close by saying this to you because I won't have time to come back to this. Somebody that will give right. Listen to me very carefully. Why do I need to give right? God said it in Malachi. For I am a great king. Who is he, please? Some of us don't even know who we are serving. Who is God? Please say it one more time. So every time you open down your treasure to give, who are you giving to? Now think of it. He said, if you give these things to your governor, will they approve of you? If you are going to meet the king of England and they said, bring a gift, what will you take? And yet, my king is the king of kings. My Lord, our Lord, is the Lord of lords. And they said, it's offering time and you are giving nothing. Nothing! I'm even afraid that you are doing this to a great king. He wants to bless us, but he wants us to give right. The Lord bless you. The Lord empower you to give right from today and forth. Both to your children, to your husband, to your community, and to your church. The church of Jesus Christ. Stand on your feet and give God praise. If you believe you are not a deceiver. Whenever you are, lift up your right hand and say, Father, say, Father, Father from, today, from today, I make a covenant with you to give right. I will no longer give by emotion, give by rationality. I will no longer give disproportionately. I will no longer give casually. I will no longer Give sparingly, I will no longer give nothing. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hold your neighbor's hand where you are. Now, you are going to look at your neighbor in the eye. Look at them in the eye. Very well. Look at them in the eye. Say, dear neighbor, from today, I honestly declare that I will no longer be an emotional giver. I will no longer be a rational giver. I 
will no longer be a disproportionate giver. I will no longer be a casual giver. I will no longer be a sparing giver. I will no longer give nothing. Don't, don't leave them. Hold their hands. Now, sit to that neighbor. Say in the name of Jesus. God will empower you to live up to your vow. Say, don't fail. And God will not fail you. Say, don't fail. And God will not fail you. Say, don't hold back. And God will not hold back from you. From this day forward. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Sit down in that spirit.